Um, well, this is the last of 2021's online gallery talks, and thank you for joining us. They've been a great way of keeping in touch with uh, visitors and friends, and we've really had a lovely time um, and enjoyed the variety of speakers we've been able to have um, by using uh, Zoom technology. We're going to continue with a mix of um, online and in-house gallery talks in 2022, and um, information is up on the website. So Derek, who you can see at the top of your screens, I think, um, has been at Welbeck for many years and has been working on these tiny memorandum books um, written by Henrietta, Duchess of Portland, for some time. And he's been regaling me with interesting tidbits from these uh, books over several years. When he told me about the accounts from Christmas in the 1830s, I was truly amazed. And I'm delighted uh, that he's agreed to share his research with you all in this talk. Whatever Christmas celebrations take place in your homes, I feel sure that none of us have celebrations that have ever come close to the prodigious spend and hospitality of the fourth Duchess of Portland. I'm going to hand you over to Derek in a second. I just want you to remind you that the talk is being recorded and it will be hosted on our website and YouTube channel. Derek's going to speak for around 20 minutes and then he'll be available for questions which you can raise on the chat bar function at the bottom of your screen. So Derek, I'm passing over to you, off you go, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, just a point, the images you will see are all drawn from the Portland collection. So I'm speaking on the richness Scott. And as Jane Austen might have written, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a great debt must be in want of an heiress. Such a single young man was William Henry Cavendish Bentinck, Marquis of Titchfield, and future fourth Duke of Portland. He knew that when he succeeded to the Portland Estates and Ducal title, he would also inherit his father's debts, which in 1809, aggravated by the third Duke's political ambitions, confectioner's bills, and maintenance of the best table in London, amounted to about a quarter of a million pounds. And that's roughly equivalent today to about 20 million pounds. The financial damage had begun early in the 18th century with a disputed will, continued with the South Sea bubble, a disastrously costly legal, legal battle over disputed land ownership, and the expenses of the third Duke's important career as politician and statesman. Despite this looming debt, the relationship between father and son was close and affectionate. Before his father's death, the fourth Duke-to-be had quietly and efficiently laid plans for repairing the accumulated damage to the family finances. One step on this path was marriage in 1795 to Miss Henrietta Scott, the rich Miss Scott of this talk's title. Whatever the financial benefit, this is not a marriage of convenience, but a marriage of true minds, a true partnership. Who was this rich Miss Scott? She was the eldest of three sisters, the others known as the witty Miss Scott and the pretty Miss Scott. Their father was soldier politician General Sir John Scott of Balcombe. Born in 1725, General Scott, at the age of 45, had made a disastrous first marriage to Lady Mary Hay, then just 16 years old. A few months later, Lady Mary ran away with a notoriously philandering army officer who not only served under General Scott, but was a guest in his house at Balcombe and Fife. Pursued and discovered, Lady Mary was assured that no harm would come to her, but the marriage was at an end and that she would be immediately divorced according to Scottish law and would be handed over to the care of her uncle. Two years after the divorce, General Sir John Scott married his second wife, the Honourable Margaret Dundas, a lady of mature years. Three daughters were born to them, but Sir John died in 1775 before the birth of their third daughter. In, his, um, in addition to his career as an army officer, landowner and politician, Sir John Scott's life must seem to us rather rackety, for he was an extraordinarily gifted gambler. 
um, through gaming, said to have amassed a fortune of half a million pounds, which is equivalent today to about 80 million. Um, in 1766, in a debt, in a, in, in a bet against a relation of his wife's, he won Dundas House in Edinburgh, now the headquarters of the Royal Bank of Scotland. This was converted by Dundas into a new built house, Bellevue Lodge, which became Ed, uh, Scott's Edinburgh country house. On Sir John's death in 1775, his eldest daughter, Henrietta Scott, Henrietta Scott, then only two years old, became his principal heir. Though there were two important conditions to her inheritance. The first was that if she were to marry a peer of the realm, she would forfeit her entire fortune. Secondly, her husband-to-be was to take the surname of Scott in recognition of her family origins and the importance of her inheritance. Twenty years after the death of her father, Henrietta, the rich Miss Scott, was courted by William Cavendish Bentinck, the young man in need of an heiress. They married in 1795, when Miss Scott was 21, old enough to know her own mind. It's important to note that although William Bentinck on his marriage was styled the Marquis of Titchfield, he was not then a peer. His title was a courtesy title, as it were borrowed from his father, the third Duke, then still living. He also willingly adopted the additional surname of Scott when Duke signing letters of Scott Portland. The terms of Sir John Scott's will were observed, so Henrietta Scott's fortune was secure. The third Duke of Portland was delighted by his son's marriage and aware of his liking for Welbeck Abbey and its estate, decided that henceforth the young couple should treat it as their own, making it their principal residence. This they happily did. The young Marquis of Titchfield had little taste for public life, perhaps influenced by his observations of its effect on his father's fortunes. He was born in 1768, was carefully educated, attended Christ Church College, Oxford for two years, though didn't take his degree. His father then sent him to The Hague for two years to gain diplomatic experience, working under the British Crown's envoy. Although he served as a member of parliament until succeeding as fourth Duke of Portland and was briefly Lord Privy Seal and Lord President of the Council, he chose instead to devote himself to the repair of his family's finances to agricultural improvement, to forestry, and to certain technological advances within the Industrial Revolution. He was the first to introduce steam locomotion to Scotland in 1817. Another triumph was his promotion of an innovative ship's hull design. He commissioned and raced two yachts against conventional ships of the line, leaving the Admiralty ships far behind. Uh, with the help of the sailor king, William IV, this led directly to the reconstruction of the entire British fleet. Family life was important. He and Marchioness Henrietta were close to their four sons and five daughters, though we might wonder that none of the sons married and only one of the daughters had children. The loss of their eldest son in 1824 was a severe blow, the dukedom ultimately passing to Lord John, the second son, famed as the reclusive fifth Duke of Portland, the underground man responsible for Welbeck's subterranean structures and driveways. On his father's death in 1809, William Bentinck succeeded as the fourth Duke of Portland. Through correspondence, portraits, records of his interests and concerns, we can form a clear view of his life and personality. His wife, however, is elusive. A few early portraits, little surviving correspondence, little or no representation in contemporary diaries. We have, however, a most remarkable resource and source of information in a series of memorandum books written by Duchess Henrietta from the late 1860s until a year or two before her death in 1844. In these little books, in microscopic handwriting, she records observations on matters of interest, together with copious records of estate and domestic costs and the management of a great country house. The detail of these records is prodigious. 
and often a little daunting, clearly indicating an obsessive personality with an intense interest in such quotidian matters. She was in complete control of her own finances and ran her household in full awareness of their complexity and scale. She even records loans of cash to her husband, together with the interest paid duly into a, a, her own accounts. If we look for an explanation for the writing of these memoranda, she perhaps wished to pass her detailed knowledge of running great houses and estates onto those who would come after her. By then, she would have known that this responsibility would almost certainly fall on her second son, Lord John, the future reclusive fifth Duke of Portland. And those responsibilities and costs were on a scale which would give anyone considerable concern, not to say anxiety, even alarm. Not just Henrietta's little books, let us share with her the celebration of Christmas in 1830, uh, revels which extended quite far into New Year 1831. She tells us that Welbeck Abbey was then full with family and guests, 100 persons present in the building, including servants. All the rooms were occupied. We are, we are told that there are 70 fires throughout the house and an extra 20 in adjacent buildings. The quantity, quantity of fuel needed was prodigious. In the abbey, its kitchens and bakehouse, about five tons of coal per day were burnt during winter. All those fires had to be maintained and guarded, fireplaces cleaned, coal carried throughout the house, ash removed, chimneys swept. We have to imagine the army um, of housemaids and other servants doing this work discreetly behind the scenes. The house was lit by candles and oil lamps. Each week, about 32 pounds of candles were required. Soap had to be bought in. In the week beginning December the 20th, 22 pounds of soap was used in the laundry, with three and a half pounds going to the men's servants and the same to the maids. In addition to family and friends staying in the house for 10 days from Christmas Eve, there were 12 extra visitors, including five children, daily in the main dining room, which would have been resplendent with fine ornamental silver and silver gilt plate. In the first fortnight, 148 accidental guests came and sat in the house, while below stairs there were 27 extra servants, probably ladies' maids, valets, coachmen and so on, who had accompanied guests travelling by horse and carriage, for the railway network had yet to be developed across England. 22 upper servants dined in the steward's room. Food and drink were, of course, absolutely uh, central to all this entertaining. And Duchess Henrietta spares us no details of quantity and cost. Her housekeeper in the first week from Christmas Eve to New Year's Eve 1830 required 88 pounds of butter, 526 eggs, 37 pounds of sugar, 36 lemons, 13 pints of cream, two pounds of black pepper, two pounds of rice, six pounds of raisins, and 12 pounds of currants. The housekeeper rather mysteriously also required paper and pack thread. This will be explained later. Um, the cost of all these uh, provisions was 12 pounds, four shillings and five pence, equivalent today to about 1400 pounds. The Abbey's professional confectioner was busy too. During that first week, he got through 228 eggs, 13 pounds of butter, 92 pounds of sugar and sugar candy, 84 oranges, 55 lemons, three pounds of ginger, 13 pounds of currants, 16 pounds of coffee, three pounds of cocoa, five and a half pounds of black tea and two pounds of green. The confectioner's expenditure continued on this level as in the next two weeks, he got through 300 oranges, 45 lemons, quantities of eggs, nutmegs, cinnamon, dried fruit, several hundred chestnuts, more tea, coffee, and cocoa, and always many, many pounds of sugar. Duchess Henrietta calculated that on average, um, in the four weeks of celebrations beginning on the 20th of December, 1830, each person ate two pounds of meat a day. She records in those four weeks the total expenditure on meat from Welbeck's farms um, and butchers, together with poultry and game, and not forgetting fish caught from the lake and bought from fishmongers, with sundries from the baker and housekeeper, 
into 279 pounds, 14 shillings and ninepence, as equivalent today to spending about 33,000 pounds on meat in four weeks. Um, the Duchess is unrelenting. She lists the exact quantity of poultry and game consumed over Christmas. 168 chickens, 6 geese, 26 turkeys, 15 ducks, 32 hares, 31 pheasants, 22 partridges, 7 woodcocks, 55 rabbits and 2 does for venison. How would all this have been dressed for the table? Well, almost certainly some would have gone in traditional English or Yorkshire Christmas pies. We're fortunate to have an illustration of one of these huge constructions. This one was served to Queen Victoria at Windsor Castle in 1857. The cooks began by boning a turkey, a goose, a brace of pheasants, four partridges, four woodcocks, and any other small game birds which came to hand. These were then stuffed with forcemeat made from fat bacon, tongue, and French truffles, all carefully sewn up with pack thread so that the stuffing could not escape. Braising pans were then lined with thin layers of fat bacon, the stuffed birds arranged neatly in them and covered with buttered paper. We now see why the housekeeper needed quantities of paper and back thread. The covered pans were then sent to the Abbey Bakehouse to be cooked slowly for about four hours. While the birds were cooking, a quantity of highly seasoned aspic jelly was prepared from game and poultry carcasses, calf's feet and root vegetables. A pastry pie case was also raised from flour, butter and very hot water, all sufficient to contain the amount of poultry intended for the pie. Such pie cases were elaborately decorated, baked blind, um, and uh, then lined with layers of thin fat bacon covered with a layer of rich li liver patty. The cooked cooled birds were then arranged in the pie, beginning with the goose surrounded by smaller game birds, any spaces filled with pate forcemeat. Turkey and pheasants formed a second layer, surrounded by slices of boiled ham, all topped by woodcocks and smaller game birds. Any gaps were filled with forcemeat and truffles, the whole covered with a thin layer of fat bacon with melted butter uh, poured over it. The richly ornamented lid was placed on the pie and the completed masterpiece sent to the bakehouse to be cooked gently for about six hours. When done, the lid was lifted to allow the reduced aspic prepared earlier to be poured into the pie, which was sealed again and set aside to become cold. The twice cooked meats immersed in fat would actually keep safely for quite a long time. Such a Christmas pie would clearly need four strong footmen to carry it in formal procession into the dining room. A separation between sweet and savoury dishes had come about slowly in England during the 18th century, but some strange old recipes combined, combining the two had lingered on. An old tradition of serving Christmas pottage or porridge, an odd medley of meat stock, wine and fruit, thickened with crushed biscuit or rice flour, probably no longer featured in English hospitality, but mince pies certainly did. These are a vestigial survivor of an ancient practice of preserving meat with sugar, alcohol and fat, persisting in, to our own times in traditional mince pies, where the fat ingredient consists of beef suet. A recipe for 19th century mince meat, which would be familiar to Duchess Henrietta, combined one and a half pounds of minced lean beef and three pounds of grated beef suet with five pounds of raisins and currants, two pounds of sugar, finely chopped apples, citron, candied lemon and orange peel, all flavoured with lemon juice and nutmeg, and not forgetting one and a half pints of brandy. This is set aside to mature uh, before use in sweet pastry cases. Apart from tea, coffee and cocoa, alcoholic beverage, beverages play the usual important part in daily life and traditional English hospitality and good cheer. In the first week of the Christmas celebrations in 1830, the company drank 71 bottles of wine and spirits, but the principal beverages were actually ale and beer. In the first week, 165 gallons, that's 1,320 pints of ale and beer were drunk. 
um, the grand total for the four weeks of Christmas 1830 to 31 were 291 bottles of wines and spirits, but 8,264 pints of ale and beer at a total cost of 180 pounds, 17 shillings and four pence, equivalent today to about 20,000 pounds. We might wonder at the effect such quantities of alcohol alcohol could have had. I had puzzled over the Duchess's regular and frequent purchases of earthen wares or ordinary domestic china and pottery. A detailed entry for 1836 makes things clear. Here, Duchess Henrietta gave details of quantities of earthenware broken annually in her household. She noted that 460 pieces of china had been broken the steward's room being particularly accident prone. There, the upper servants had managed to dispose of 66 dinner plates, 14 meat and vegetable dishes, six sauce boats, a dozen cups and saucers, and 26 other pieces of domestic china. These frequent accidents might well have been the result of a little overindulgence. In case an emphasis on rich meat dishes skews our impression of the daily diet eaten at the Duchess's table, there would also have been vegetables brought from the Great Abbey kitchen gardens, hothouse fruits such as pineapples and grapes, stored apples and pears from the orchards, and great quantities of preserved peaches, nectarines, gooseberries, strawberries and so on, prepared throughout the year by industrious maids working in the still room all noted in meticulous details by Duchess Henrietta. Duchess Henrietta's little memorandum books open doors onto a past world of extraordinary open hand generosity and celebration of Christmas, which in one month would have cost the modern equi equivalent of about 55,000 pounds. The books give us insight into the concerns and daily life of a remarkable woman who would otherwise uh, would remain the shadowy and distant rich Miss Scott. Thank you very much. Derek, thank you very much. You don't know whether to be deeply relieved that you're not part of such a Christmas uh, celebration, or just to think how extraordinary it must have been to have been a guest there. And, and the question I have is, you talk about 148 uh, accidental visitors. Are these um, friends of the family? Are they uh, kind of chances who think they'll get a sort of hot meal? Who are the... the, the I, I'm, sure, I'm sure it would have been a bit of both. Um, it was an established tradition in great houses that on certain days throughout the year, um, anyone known to the family could come and uh, take a meal, take dinner, uh, whether or not the family was in residence or no. So this kind of traditional open house hospitality uh, was at that time an English tradition. And at Christmas, of course, it would have been particularly, um, uh, particularly popular. Yeah. And so people, friends, neighbours, associates of any kind, and chances, no doubt, would have come. But of course, they would have to be very respectably dressed. Indeed. I mean, incredible. And another question I have is, Obviously, those lists of the huge quantities of meat or whatever do make one smile. But two pounds of black pepper, that's an awful lot of black pepper. It's a huge amount of black pepper. And I just one, I wondered about that myself. I have no answer to how that was used. Uh, but it's, it's quite likely that quite high spicing of dishes was still um, uh, the normal practice. Uh, a degree of high spicing which would be unfamiliar to us, except through, you know, um, foreign and exotic food. Um, but I think it was a tradition, and, and in sweet dishes as well, yeah. so that uh, things would be quite highly spiced. I mean, and I, I think that one should scotch the idea that spices were used to disguise um, food that was going off. I, I don't believe in that at all. Uh, I think there just was a taste for in, intense flavours. Yeah. And uh, like this um, almost legendary uh, Christmas pottage, which is the strangest mixture Indeed. of um, a strong meat stock with fruit 
um, it, it, and alcohol. It, 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 it's such an odd mixture. Yeah, in fact, one of the uh, people on the Zoom, uh, Hannah, has suggested that maybe the pepper was rubbed on the meat, and I think that's probably quite likely. Oh, that sort of thing, I'm sure, was yeah. common practice. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, um, in a household such as uh, Welbeck Abbey, um, a lot of the cooking would have been very elegant. Um, a lot of it would have been um, French influenced or maybe mm. even Italian influenced. Um, it would have been a sophisticated kind of diet. Uh, I mean, but just the quantities seem extraordinary. That's the thing that strikes us most strongly. Yeah, you know, I'm fascinated because you think, God, what a grim life as a servant there, you know, toiling over the 90 fireplaces. On the other hand, you were eating and drinking very well. Oh, oh yes. And of course, the point is there would have been, uh, with all these vast quantities of uh, food going to the main dining rooms, there would be a lot left over. And so the leftovers would go both to, both to servants and to the local poor families. Mm. So all the surplus from the tables would have been uh, distributed. Um, it would not have gone to waste. Mm. So another question from Angela is, um, do we have any indication of what decorations there were? And I know we've got photographs from further on at, towards the end of the 19th century. Do we have anything from... Um, uh, um, as far as I know, there are no records of exactly how the rooms would have been decorated for Christmas, uh, but they would have been decorated. Um, it's before the period of the Christmas tree, which comes into uh, Britain with Prince Albert after mm. his marriage to Victoria. Uh, but bringing in evergreens and so on, that would have been, um, and, and scented evergreens in particular, uh, that would have been a, a common practice. So so we, not quite as we know it, but the rooms would have been decorated. Yeah. It would have been a very festive scene. Mm. Well, I mean, obviously, especially in the current time, the idea of that amount of food and drink and guests mm. it is mind boggling. And it's been completely brilliant to hear you talk about the books. Thank you so much. I just wonder, Derek, is there another slide at the end of your talk which um, gives information about January and February? Or um, are you at the end of your talk now? There is. Thank you so much. And, and there it is. There we go. So it, it's been a complete pleasure. I've been fascinated by these books ever since Derek started working on them. And I hope you've enjoyed some of the details as well. Uh, it just now is for me to say, very happy Christmas and uh, we really do look forward to seeing you in 2022 and we hope it will be a better year for us all. So on at the end of January it's Laura Sherburn who works at the Portland Collection whose interest is in uh, 17th century uh, English history and then at the end of February Lauren from our curatorial department will talk to everyone about some of the work that they do down there conserving and looking after objects from the Portland collection. And I too would like to wish everyone a very happy Christmas and a happy and healthful new year. Indeed. Everyone thank say so thank you. Thank you Pat, thank you Hannah, thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.